Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. But more importantly, uh, today we are interviewing the fantastic Adam Gibson, one of the geniuses behind uh, Join Market, uh, working with CoinJoin and privacy-based uh, Bitcoin implementations. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? Are you, is that me? You're calling me sir? That's, that's, that is you, yes. <laughs> sir, sir is not a required... Uh... Monica. Um, no, so uh, I'm, I'm great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's uh, always fun. Chat Bitcoin. Yeah, I guess I'll crack on. Just start us off with, uh, with a question um, about yourself, uh, about, I guess, kind of <clears> like, uh, well, I was thinking kind of, I, I used to kind of go to more, towards the beginning of the Bitcoin journey. So hmm. I understand uh, from listening to some podcasts you're in and uh, researching yourself, uh, you were a nuclear engineer at one point. Um, I was, yeah. And, yeah, you taught in China as well. So like two mm -hmm. quite sort of interesting things from the get-go, really, uh, to <laughs> me at least. Um, I guess my first question, and the reason for me asking this makes sense further on, is what was it like being in China when you were there? Because as someone who's lived there, mm. uh, from like your experiences with the culture and the government, uh, mm. I guess that may give you some kind of understanding of this sort of Bitcoin ban that they're doing and, and, and the motives mm. and where mm. that might be going. So I guess I was, I was interested yeah. to see what that might be. Yeah, I mean, I would only be opinion, of course. I mean, by the time I left, which was around the same time I got interested in Bitcoin, um, I remember having some quite amusing conversations with, with people there uh, in early 2013. Like, um, I'll always vividly remember, like, uh, speaking to a work colleague about Bitcoin. He was kind of interested, but he said, look, he said, look Adam, I'm, I, this is really pretty interesting, but I've got to be honest, I just think it's too expensive. <laughs> and it was like 700 RMB or about, you know, 60 or $70 a coin or whatever it is, you know, $100 a coin. Um, but yeah, about this whole kind of culture and like how it plays into, you know, are they banning it? Are they not banning it? How do they look on mining? Um, I mean, there's many elements to it. I mean, the first point is that the sort of Bitcoin philosophy didn't resonate very easily with people in that part of the world, at least if you're talking like in the most generic way, because culturally there's a very strong tendency towards, you know, putting the group above the individual. And so there's always a tendency to think in terms of hierarchical structures. That's true everywhere in the world, but it's 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 just that little bit more true in Asia uh, and, and China is probably a predominant example of that. So there's a lot of, you know, the idea of a, of, a, of a technology or a system that doesn't have a leader is is really doesn't it doesn't sit easily. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean there aren't they aren't open minded and there's plenty of open minded people, but it, it's just it was it was a little bit more difficult. But there is a strong kind of gambling culture there. I want to say so that's a little bit sort of pejorative, but um, investments are uh, there's there's a kind of investment crazes in China are a big thing they they have been for I don't know how far back that goes but certainly as far back as I was there which I first went there in 2004 or 5 time and um you know sometimes they, 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 they'll be like a whole 6 month period where every everyone's investing in oolong tea or everyone's investing in this you know like copper or I, various kinds of metals or something and 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 part of it is because like there's a kind of financial suppression there there, there are some academics who've looked into this and um you know during the whole period of china's economic rise it was it was a very difficult thing for the the middle and lower classes because all they really could do is put their money in the bank where it was being paid interest which was significantly lower than inflation um so there was this kind of financial repression and you know they could just like oh i'll just open up a retail brokerage account and invest in the s p 500 you, you can't do that you know so it's a very complicated story um so there's that and then in the, the whole thing about like bitcoin not being something that follows the normal process of having a control having a hierarchy having someone you can talk to is it was a real like problem for the ccp because they they're, they're obsessed with with keeping power first and foremost, and and part of that is controlling the narrative about everything, including things like investments. You know, all the ups and downs of the stock market. Uh, a lot of them are driven by the CCP's decisions, and um, and so having something they couldn't really easily control was really hard. And and I think a lot of what you saw in the early years of Bitcoin with them kind of like vacillating a bit, like there'd there'd be a news story come out would say something nice about it, and then later on they'd be oh this is a terrible idea, don't you? But, I think people at the higher ends of the hierarchy in China didn't 
really know how to deal with this. I'm sure a lot of them just ignored it. Other, others thought it was stupid. But they, to the extent that they took it seriously, they were like, what the heck do we do about this? And so in the end, they only did the same kind of thing as they did, for example, with the the peer-to-peer -peer lending um, phenomenon that, that th was sort of grew up in, I think, 2016 to 2018 period in China, which is like, we just try and crack down. We try our best to crack down. And we just, eventually, they sort of got their, their, their minds around it, uh, you know, within the last year or two. And like, they started cracking down on exchanges. Then it was, you know, then it was cracking down on mining. And they, they'll, just, they'll just do their best to make it so that, think about the internet itself, right? Chinese people, in theory, have access to the internet and can read all the same things freely as we can, but in practice they can't because the, the crackdowns are kind of effective on a, on a social level. It's all through society. It's one of those things with China. Um, I suppose another potential motive of theirs could be this kind of digital yuan, um, sort of CBC mm. kind of style mm. coin that they have coming as well. And, and I know a lot of governments around the world are looking at CBDCs and trying to sort of always threaten the stable coin uh, environment mm. as a result. Um, but I guess um, to move away from well, CBDCs and stable coins and more more kind of uh, Bitcoin oriented, I suppose, in, in discussion. Because uh, obviously one thing that I can see from your current work and your involvements is that you're a privacy conscious guy, a privacy focused mm. guy with what you do. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, China is not the most privacy. <laughs> it's a bit more Orwellian almost in, in a sense, mm. in the way that the government runs things. And it's kind of a, a very sort of stark contrast, I suppose, in a way to that. Um, so I guess I wondered, like, before you got involved in Bitcoin and in your current work, like, yeah. was privacy very much like a focus for you, like, for, for a long time in your life? Or, or was that something that more kind of hmm. came about with Bitcoin? If you go, hmm. was it a pre-Bitcoin yeah. pre thing or not? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I, mean, I mean, the short answer is it's, it, it starts with Bitcoin, really, because, um, but also, I mean, the sort of motivating forces to me to get interested in Bitcoin, I wouldn't say they were actually related to privacy i'd say they were more related to independence and autonomy you know like um the experience something you experience a lot if you do spend time living in other countries is the difficulty of dealing with banks and of course there's, there's a vast array of that kind of difficulty i mean if we're talking about nigeria for example right <laughs> that's pretty serious there's a lot of problems in africa dealing with banks i know uh, not from personal experience from what people have told me and uh, but even if you say, you know, you, English, you might think some people in the world might think, oh, English people, it's easy. You know, banks, they don't give, cause you any problems. But, you know, you try living in one country and being like a citizen in a, in a second and, you know, working in a third and, and, you know, resident in one, having your bank in another one and then going on a holiday in a fifth one or sixth one or whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the layers and layers of problems. And one thing I noticed coming back to England after spending a long time abroad is that like the layers and layers of bureaucracy in every kind of payment and every kind of like service, you, it's, it's, it's awful. Uh, it's, it's like you can't win. You either, you're either in a very sophisticated place and then you've got to fill out 55 different forms. But obviously it's online nowadays, but you know, phone these different people. And like, if you have one T with it, not I not dotted or whatever in some particular thing, then the service doesn't get provided. So that's the kind of one extreme. And then the other extreme is, you know, you go to a third world country and, and like banks just won't deal with you or, or, or like to send a wire transfer. You have to, you have to like throw away half the money and wait seven weeks. Um, and all of these sort of in, in interferences were something that kind of made me more open-minded to the idea of a system, no, no matter how radical and no matter how superficially ridiculous, because, you know, I think people sometimes forget how ridiculous Bitcoin is as a concept. <laughs> because well, what do I mean by that? Because if you actually read the white paper, you say, wait, hang on, you're going to have a database and every single person using the database is going to hold the whole database in real time? Are you mad? <laughs> and of course, it is ridiculous. And, and I would say that like 90% of engineers that looked at it, maybe 99% just said this just obviously doesn't work. Um, but the people who maybe took it a bit more seriously, either, you know, it was Hal Finney because A is a genius and B was looking into this for years, or it's because, you know, they're open-minded to actually, we do need something no, no matter how extreme has this property of not depending on a, on, on these sort of, uh, you know, structures. Yeah.
What, what, what was the start of that conversation? I've forgotten what I was talking about. <laughs> no, you're all good. It was just, it was more so sort of like whether, I think you answered it, like whether your privacy consciousness oh, yeah, privacy, yeah. predated or, or not really. You know, I don't think so. And I, I don't think I'm more uh, privacy conscious than the average person. But when you start getting into Bitcoin, then you start, I mean, in my case, that meant getting into cryptography as well, because I, I just, it's just my nature is I'm just going to go into the, the bottom layer of it and actually try at least to understand it properly. And then I got really fascinated by all the cryptography that surrounds it. And then you start sort of studying. I remember like spending, maybe it was 2013 or 14, I spent like a month or two actually going through these challenges. They're called the Matasano challenges, or they were at the time anyway. And it's like you go through every like different way that cryptography is used in, in actual real systems and you just slowly build it up. And you realize that you, you have to have this paranoid mindset. There's all these different ways that things can be attacked. And, you know, trying to defend privacy is very, very difficult, uh, just in the sense of, like, trying to encrypt data. There are so many ways you can screw up doing that. Uh, and then as you as you start using Bitcoin, you see, you know, all the limitations and all the difficulties of trying to um, trying to have a reasonable level. So, so, so I see, in other words, I see it more as, like, I, I, I have a reasonable level of privacy. And I think most people think they have, but probably they don't think about it too much. I'm not super paranoid about nobody knowing anything about me. I just have like a normal level of privacy. But trying to match that either to modern IT systems in the in the normal world or to Bitcoin is extremely hard because just by default, you have so little privacy. I just wanted to ask, if, if you weren't that privacy conscious, how did you hmm. first get involved with Join Market? Yeah. So as I said, it was like the, tra the transition was more like, oh, I'm interested in like independence uh, forms of money. And in I'm interested in open source. I'm interested in decentralization. And then we go through the whole Bitcoin thing. And then it more comes out of that. Like the, the, the arrow to me is more like, you know, coming into Bitcoin via some general philosophical ideas than from Bitcoin going to cryptography, which is that's the step that a lot of people don't go because, you know, a lot of people don't have math degrees or, or, or are interested in those very sort of technical things. So they don't tend to go into the cryptography direction. But I did. And in parallel to that, like looking at these new ways of using Bitcoin that are kind of leveraging the cryptographic techniques, whether it be coin swaps or coin joins or stuff, got very interested in that multi-sigs as well back in 2014. Uh, Chris Belcher, I sort of met him at that time because we were both like investigating multi-sig, coin join, coin swap. We were fascinated by these things. And so it's like from there, realizing that Bitcoin is difficult to use privately and that privacy slash fungibility, you know, you could debate about the relative meanings of the two terms, are a crucial part of Bitcoin success as eventually, we hope, a, a big scale medium exchange. Um, it led me into that direction because it was a combination of seeing that that was needed and thinking that was an area I could contribute to. Because obviously there's a ton of things that are needed. I can't, I don't necessarily have the right skill set for all of them. So it's not so much that I came in, oh, I'm the privacy guy. What should I do in this and be the privacy guy? I, I, no, privacy is just like one of the things that this needs to me. You're being like a sort of final final piece to a puzzle, I guess, or, or a piece into the puzzle that's piece, needed yeah. to, to create it. Yeah, I understand that. I suppose one thing, um, I guess, on the on the privacy topic um, hmm. is, uh, well, we've we've had uh, Ricardo Spagni, Fluffy Pani on, on the show. Yeah. Uh, and we've had it was Giacomo Zucco, I believe, who mm -hmm. had quite an opposing opinion. So, so obviously, mm -hmm. Fluffy Pani, obviously, as a, a Monero lead maintainer, he, he's mm -hmm. pretty pro the idea of privacy baked in on the, mm -hmm. on, the mm -hmm. on the blockchain, essentially, on the, on the base yeah. layer. Uh, and Giacomo, I, again, it could be wrong here, but I think it was Giacomo who essentially was saying that he felt that privacy shouldn't really necessarily be well, mm. you know, it shouldn't sort of be uh, over. Essentially, what I think what he was trying to get at was that the base layer should be kept quite straightforward, and then, mm. Mm. like with internet, uh, the internet, mm. and then everything's baked on top on different yeah. layers. Um, and I didn't know kind of where you sat, where you sat with your personal views on that kind of not argument, but just on that kind of uh, idea as to whether everything should be baked in at the at the base layer, or whether you're more of a kind of in agreement with the whole like layers this, this argument that essentially actually the base layer should be quite straightforward, quite simple and quite clutter free and actually everything else should be kind of laid on top in order to uh, take advantage in the best way. Yeah. So I, I almost want to, it's probably annoying when people say this in podcasts and interviews, but I, I always want to refer you to what I said in, in a, in a, in a panel back in, in Lisbon in 2018, because I think I, th I, I, I'm still proud of this. It's probably quite silly to be proud of such a thing, but it was like mid 2018. If I got my timeline right. And I've said the the problem with, you know, systems like Monero and Zcash is that you can have bugs which aren't really like just crappy code bugs and they aren't really like 
oh, the system's entirely broken, but they're sort of somewhere in between, you know, somewhere in between like the academic and the code that people actually run. Something can go wrong. And the problem with systems like Zcash is because of the obfuscation, um, it means that nobody can know that something has gone wrong. And, um, you know, the the reason I'm saying, I'm proud of saying that is because about six months later, it turned out that Zcash, that exact thing had happened in Zcash six months before I'd said it. It happened like a year before they announced it, which is kind of amazing that they took a year before they decided to uh, spread this information to the world. Um, something like that anyway. Um, and, but the, you know, the other thing I remember, I remember that, 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 that chat we had on that panel. Cause one of the other things I said was like, the problem here is that like it's the absolute fundamental principle of a blockchain, like the DNA of a blockchain is public verifiability. Um, and, you know, it's easy for an academic cryptographer to just to say, scoff at my point of view and say, oh, doesn't matter. You know, we, this is mathematically sound. You know, for example, a, a crude example is well, not crude, but a typical example is confidential transactions where, you know, you use actual mathematics to prove that, that, that the sums add up, even though you can't see the numbers. Right. And that's that's true. So you can say, oh, so this is still publicly verified, right? But it's, it's subtly or maybe not subtly different between an absolutely plain uh, base layer and um, and uh, one which is still verifiable, but under certain assumptions. People often like jump into the whole quantum computing debate at this point. They start saying, oh, uh, you know, we, we have to worry about whether... You know, they worry about something like confidential transactions based on the fact that it uses Pedersen commitments and Pedersen commitments rely on the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. The elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem assumes there's no quantum computers. And you know, they get into this kind of old technical debate. And I think people sort of fetishize too much to like these exact mathematical facts, whereas the real world is very messy. So it's to me, it's more that the, the concern is more like what's this gap that we have between our eyes that we can verify directly something and you know, these base level assumptions. And like in the case of that Zcash problem, it was it was simply a matter of just making a slight error in like writing out a transcript, like the one particular entry in a transcript that shouldn't have been written out, that was written out. It's, you know, it's just some weird thing that maybe like 50 people in the world know about or care about. And just because one of them happened to make a mistake, the whole system was like completely screwed. So I think, although intuitively, and, you know, Fluffy Pony's been making that argument for I don't know how many years. And, and, and all the people in his camp is like, if it's not baked into the base layer, it doesn't work. Um, you know, you can build, uh, it's like that thing, you can, you can build a censorship resist, uh, you can't build a censorship resistant layer on top of a non-censorship resistant layer. And I think they try to make the same argument with privacy, and I'm not really sure it's true. And, I, and I've also made the analogy that you made which is, you know, look at how it worked in the real world with uh, with the internet. It, we had TCIP. It was, you know, crappy in many ways. And one way it's crappy is it's completely plain text. Arguably, is it? I don't know. And then we built, you know, SSL version one on it. That was crap. But then they built SSL version two, and eventually they built TLS, and TLS was actually good enough to the point where we now have kind of reasonable, reasonable certainty of, of the basic operation of it. So it might seem like superficially this is the wrong thing to have a plain text base layer, but both from the point of view of scalability and also from the point of view of verifiability, there is an argument that says actually the base layer needs to be super, super simple. It's it's arguable. It's arguable. So you've asked like one of the biggest questions in, in Bitcoin and, and the whole of cryptocurrency. So I, if, excuse me for answering rather long. <laughs> no, you're fine. I, I appreciate the answer. And um, yeah, I guess to be fair, it's something that neither uh, Ricardo or, or Jack, again, it could be Giacomo. I think it was Giacomo. Uh, Probably mentioned. was, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. Um, but I, yeah, it's just, yeah, never got, I've not got the best of memories. So uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, you kind of raised a point that I guess, uh, they didn't necessarily mention, which was very obviously, I suppose, that, you know, if you can't see what's happening on the blockchain, mm. then there are potential issues. And then, as you said, with Zcash, exactly that did happen and yeah, did it get did get exposed too. after you said it, which is quite interesting, actually. Mm. Uh, I guess that's something I hadn't really, I guess I hadn't really obviously considered, I suppose, uh, which is a good point. I mean, Monero had a couple of bugs, but uh, I, uh, one of them didn't actually make it to mainnet. So that was a, that was a lucky, because uh, Jonas Nick uh, found it. Another one, I mean, I don't know, maybe they tell me that that didn't matter. The other one, it, it did make it to mainnet, and it was like based on um, 
based on a small subgroup attack. I mean, nobody cares the details, but the, the point is it wasn't, in a way, it wasn't really the huge catastrophic fail that, that Zcash had because the real nightmare scenario is when you have a bug that can allow inflation, infinite or finite, it doesn't really matter, but it's generally going to be infinite if it, if it happens without anybody noticing. And in, in that case, it wouldn't have been without anybody noticing. So it wasn't nearly as bad, but the, the, the principle still stands that, I mean, look, it's very debatable. I would say, like, you ask nine out of ten professional cryptographers, professionals in the, in the field will will probably disagree with me and say, you know what, you know, yes, systems are difficult to get right, but we can get them right. We can build them with proofs such that, you know, we know, we have assurance that actually you're not going to lose this stuff. But I, I can tell you one little sort of dirty secret, having, having spent quite a bit of time reading Cryptograph, uh, crypt cryptography papers is um, a lot of the time I can't understand the detailed security proofs. They're, they're very difficult, some of them. But in the cases where I did understand them, I think I've got a hit rate of something like two out of five where I found errors in the security proofs, which I told the authors and they said, yeah, that's that's actually an error. Uh, so yeah, I'm just saying like, a crypto this, you know, the quality of certainty we have in cryptography is sometimes overestimated because it seems like this magic and there's all these gray beards and they know everything but there's a lot of like there's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> i think fair point and uh, yeah i think yeah most people working in, in uh, actually working on the uh well the technical side of bitcoin or even just to us any crypto are wizards to me <laughs> to be frankly honest with you right um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, put it, uh, I'll be honest there but um i guess like again and again not to like recycle questions i've asked uh, to other people but i suppose now that we've kind of gone down this uh, this this sort of route where, where we're talking about uh, like the, the build of, of Bitcoin or the build of Monero and and layers. Um, mm, mm. One question that well, not really question. I guess a gripe. It was one that uh, I think it was John Carvalho. This must have been a few months ago, maybe a month ago, that he raised on Twitter, where he essentially mm. he was he was frustrated. Uh, he's trying to build some some Bitcoin related. Uh, uh, I think he's trying to build a wallet and, and other other things uh, mm. basically around the Bitcoin environment. Um, and he was frustrated with basically that saying that the core the Bitcoin core devs were implementing too many new features. And oh. essentially, every time these changes are coming in, he's get, he has to it then completely sets back his development of the wallet app, and he has to keep starting again and starting again from different points, hmm. and causing him setbacks. So he was pretty upset by that. And I can understand that. Um, and he was basically essentially saying that you know Bitcoin core needs to kind of concentrate on making the Bitcoin software and everything around it is lightweight and as dumb and as simple as physically possible. Mm. Um, mm. Now, they have done a good job of actually speeding everything up because I saw someone the other day comparing, mm. I think mm. it was Bitcoin Core versus, I think, the real Bitcoin or something, where there's <laughs> side pro, where essentially it's like the original Satoshi. And it, and it was so slow compared to what it yeah. is now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I didn't know... I didn't know if kind of what your thoughts were on that, where you sat on that, where the... And, and again, not to sort of try and ask you to criticise, you know, Bitcoin core devs when at the end of the day they're doing a pretty stand-up job. But um, I guess I didn't know where you stood on that sort of argument of, hey, when do we stop like constantly upgrading and actually just make it really, really basic and start concentrating yeah. on lightning or uh, others? Yeah, I know what you mean. I think this, this the, the problem I have with answering that question is I think there's two different kinds of complaints that that, that you could have. One of them is, is about like adding new features at the protocol layer, things like Taproot, right? And I think at that layer, I would I would disagree with the complaint simply because I think the pace at which new protocol features are added is pretty damn slow, really. But that's that's subjective. But I think another separate complaint that you might have is things like oh changes to the RPC API. You know the the the, the, the way that you call. Like if you're writing a wallet, you need to somehow talk to Bitcoin Core. You don't have to. It depends on how you write a wallet. But let's just say you write that kind of wallet. Then you might need to deal with changes in the RPC, like the the, the, the language you, you talk to Bitcoin Core in the back end to, to give you the information you need. Uh, that's, that's that's kind of a more technical question that's specific to developers. And you know, maybe they're changing RPC in the, in a way that they shouldn't. Maybe there's I, I don't really know to be honest. I mean, I remember many changes over the last few years, specifically with like the Wallet API. I'm not sure if they were that big of a deal. So I think overall, on balance, I'm not really i would tend not to agree with john's uh, complaint there but i have heard other people say something similar i don't think it's a completely unreasonable statement you know that but the, the idea that the, 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 perhaps what's under the hood there is this, this whole thing about ossification which is a term that you know I, I suppose people started talking about it maybe three four years ago 
And, and I, was, I was definitely one of those that's in a camp that says, we need this to, to ossify. And there's other people who say, A, it's ridiculous, because it's just not, you know, it, it, we're not there. It's not ossifying that yet. There's, there's, it needs to be changed in various ways. And some people just don't think that's a valid concept. But I think it is a valid concept because fundamentally, if you want to trust a currency, you need to know that, you know, you go to bed and it's a bar of gold. You don't wake up, it's in a bar of aluminium or something, right? It's supposed to be one thing, right? And of course, little, little additional features like taproot don't really fundamentally change it because at the base, you've just got this blockchain humming along and there's transactions going in and out. It doesn't really change it. But you don't want big changes, I think. Um, and so you probably do want things to slow down. It, it, and, and isn't it true that they are slowing down? I mean, it seems that way to me. I just wanted to know what impact uh, Taproot will have on coin joins and mm. coin swaps and pay joins. Yeah, okay, well, all, all of them. Okay, so with the basic style of coin join that is implemented today, that's the style of coin join where you have multiple outputs of the same value. And you, you get obfuscation from the fact that, that you know, Outside observers don't know which which output belongs to who. So for those, the impact of Taproot uh, is something I'm going to need to look into in the next few months, but I haven't really started yet. But as far as I'm aware, there's there's very little impact there, either positive or negative. Um, but I suspect we're going to find that CoinJoin implementers want to move to it fairly quickly. This, this is actually debatable. Uh, we want to we want a big anonymity set, you know, and, and we want to share it with as many different applications as possible. And I think Lightning is probably going to lead the way on that. But it's in, it, well, my, my, my main point there is I don't think it's a very interesting story, Taproot, with regard to, to, to standard CoinJoin. Because standard CoinJoin doesn't use interesting scripts. It doesn't use backouts. Um, an interesting thing about CoinJoin, which I think maybe some people don't realize, is that unlike, although it is a smart contract technically, because it's a bunch of people getting together and making an agreement where they don't have to trust each other. Uh, it's a very simple kind of smart contract, and it doesn't require like a backout clause or anything like that. So it doesn't really do the main thing the Taproot is designed to do. Um, now, the Schnorr signature aspect at the moment is not going to mean very much at all either. It'll, it'll shave off a few bytes, but that's it. Um, now, CoinSwap, on the other hand, is a very different story because Schnorr specifically, which is people sometimes forget, is part of Taproot. The, 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 the Taproot soft fork is the, the Schnorr signature um, in it. And that makes coin swaps a lot more elegant, uh, a lot better, in fact. And I'm not saying necessarily that I know like Belcher's project, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where he is with the various options. There's these very difficult like judgments he has to make, like do we want to share the anonymity set of the existing uh, ECDSA signature scheme, or is it okay to like have a have a coin swap system which is using the new short Schnorr signature scheme? Because obviously, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make these transactions as much as possible like look like typical transactions, and we can do that with Taproot. But then we're in that smaller Taproot anonymity set. Uh, it's a complicated set of discussions, but fundamentally, if we ignore the whole anonymity set discussion, uh, a coin swap works better with. With, tap, with with Schnorr specifically, not Taproot so much, although Taproot might help, specifically because um, what you can do with a Schnorr signature, because of its linearity, you can kind of embed a secret inside the signature. And you may or may not know how you know, Lightning and other, other systems that use atomic swap techniques need this kind of special shared secret between the two parties where if one of them publishes on chain, they reveal the secret to the other party. And with Schnorr signatures, you can like embed the signature in such a way that that, like if it's Alice and Bob doing the swap, like if Alice decides to broadcast the transaction early, Bob should get his money back. And he's gonna get his money back by looking at Alice's transaction and extracting that secret value from the transaction she broadcasted. But the beautiful thing is nobody else in the world is gonna know what that secret is or, or that a secret was published in that transaction. It's gonna look like a totally normal one. Whereas today, if you did an atomic swap, and you know, in certain branches of Lightning, this is true as well. If one party, party publishes a transaction, in order for, this, for the other party to be secure and get their money back, they have to read an actual separate field inside the transaction, which is gonna be very obvious to the rest of the world in order to extract their own half of the money or their own you know, whatever. Yeah, so that's coin swap. Now, pay join is really just like doing a payment with a coin join where the recipient produces one, uh, supplies one input. So it's it's like other coin joins. It's a very simple smart contract. There are no special scripts. There are no backout clauses. 
So therefore, again, it doesn't really imp impact it meaningfully. Um, there is a scenario in the future which doesn't apply with the current Taproot soft fork, and that would be the scenario where there is cross-input signature aggregation. In Where we have cross-input signature aggregation, remember, in a, in a Bitcoin tra transaction, uh, a lot of the space is taken up by the signatures, which is part of what SegWit was about because it changes that economics. But nevertheless, in terms of bytes, the largest part of the transaction is a signature. Now, Schnorr signature changes that from maybe 72 to 73 bytes on average down to about 64. So it's a small change there. But the much more significant impact would be if we had cross input signature aggregation, which would mean that, you know, with 20 inputs in the, in the, in the transaction, instead of having 20 signatures, you could have just one. So it would obviously make the transaction much cheaper or much smaller. And it would also incentivize coin join because it would actually make more economic sense for 50 people to get together and do a transaction than for each of them to do a transaction separately. So, but that's not in included. And I think there are various technical issues around actually implementing cross input signature aggregation. So I'm not quite sure when it's gonna happen, but I hope it will happen. Because it'll make Bitcoin way more efficient and it will make coin join much more desirable. You know, personal observation, I've seen that yeah. people the adoption of um, privacy enhancing tools is not really as big as it can be. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, so what do you think would be the reason? Could it be, you know, a UX issue or that? I remember you mentioned that, you know, um, you are just basically the same as the average you know, person when it comes mm -hmm. to you know, protecting their privacy. Mm -hmm. And do you think it could be, you know, kind of like a lackadaisical attitude towards, you know, people's, mm -hmm. you know, um, perception of privacy and privacy? Do they actually want to, you know, shield themselves from the world or could it be, you know, a UX issue when it comes to, you know, enhancing their privacy when, you know, using Bitcoin or they're just fine with, you know, mm, the way, yeah. you know, it's a, could it be a you know, behavioral issue or it's the problem with the tools that they have currently? Honestly, I think it's a bit of everything. I mean, it's, it's difficult, right? So first of all, there's that whole problem of people finding time and finding the um, motivation to actually like claim personal sovereignty at all, even setting aside privacy, you know, like running your own node, that's difficult. It may even be impossible in certain situations. Um, and then even if you don't run your own node, that there's like other ways you could like be more sovereign than just simply handing over everything to a third party, turning over everything to a company, which is like the default way most people operate. You know, most people use things like Coinbase or something like that. Uh, so there's that whole thing of like people taking the initiative to take their own responsibility. That itself is the biggest hurdle. Then, you know, the next thing is, well, you even have people who will say, like who could use privacy tools, but who choose not to in the case of Bitcoin, because they're worried that how it makes them look. They're worried that, you know, if I do a coin join, then when I when I try and sell it to someone else, are they going to think I'm I'm a, a criminal, you know? So if you think about that, first of all, that's, that's a serious problem. But, you know, it's like um, it, it's a question of like be, the crowd you're in. I, earlier, I was talking about the technical concept of anonymity set, you know, like when you do a coin swap or a coin join, you want to know you want to know that you're in a big crowd because it makes it more private. And if you think about it, it's all kind of conflated together, isn't it? It's like if everyone used coin join, everyone who used Bitcoin used coin join then it wouldn't be any stigma. There were, even if you were that kind of person, you would never think, oh, I'm worried that I'm using a coin join. It makes me look like a criminal because everyone else is doing it too, right? So, so like, it's like the, you want to be inside the crowd. And I think it's, it's quite rational and logical to, be, to want to be inside the crowd, to avoid standing out because then people are going to attack you, people, authorities, criminals, you know, whatever. You don't want to stand out. So I think that's reasonable. And then you also mentioned UX. And I think that's a very fair uh, point to raise is that, um, it is hard to, to have UX that is natural and easy and doesn't interrupt people's normal flow. They just want to do a payment. They just want to get some money, whatever. Uh, but if they have to press several other buttons and they have to maybe wait longer times uh, or maybe even the worst thing, that maybe they have to pay even more fees to get more privacy, then they're all, they're all barriers to to people um, getting more privacy. So we're always looking, you know, as, as, as the technical pe community, we're always looking for ways we can introduce tools that have the lowest friction, the lowest cost, and perhaps most important of all, the biggest anonymity set. How can we like extend it out so that this is not a tool that makes you stand out from the crowd? You know, at the moment we haven't really achieved that, you know, different degrees of success, sure, but we haven't really achieved 
all of that, which would make privacy uh, tool usage widespread or, or just default even better. I suppose uh, more and more sort of attempted uh, government bans that are occurring and things like the EU announcing their, well, that was overplayed a little bit, but they're, 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 they're going to try and sort of get rid yeah. of anonymous wallets and things like that. Yeah. Um, that. That will kind of push more and more people probably over time, though, towards privacy because it will kind of be more, more privacy-focused um, implementations and technologies because it will kind of be necessary, I suppose. And you're, so, obviously an op- you're obviously an optimist. <laughs> but I, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you can tell, I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> not, non-optimistic a lot of the time when it comes to uh, governments. But um, I guess... Um, so I wanted to ask you actually, which kind of uh, swerves a little bit uh, away from just kind mm. of privacy, is uh, in the world of uh, Bitcoin, but also I guess even in the world of cryptocurrency, as you mm. know, sometimes there's interesting ideas floating around. Um, is there anything? I guess what's like, what's most exciting to you right now, like out there in the world mm. of crypto and, and Bitcoin? Mm. Mm. What's kind of on your yeah, mind? Yeah. Um, well, in terms of uh, <clears throat> let's say not not the super techie stuff, but just like the real world usage i'm i'm very excited by by lightning i i have been since like early 2018 um you know i was i was <clears throat> running lightning and even coding a little bit i did some lnd coding work um and just messing around with lightning buying things um even as early as like early 2018 and it was it was really fun then and it's i think especially the last few months i'm getting a Especially like more positive vibe about it now. Like there seems to be even more I- initiatives on 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 how to use it. And the thing is, I've always thought Lightning was kind of kind of like a, quite imperfect in in many ways. There's a lot of rough edges there, and it's a very complicated protocol. I think I think it, I always saw it as being likely to succeed in some sense because because of um, because of that. You know, I hate being like Silicon Valley talk or whatever, but you know, that 10 X effect, you know, it's like, you need something to be just like, not just better, but it needs to be a ton better. And I think maybe a lot of people early on didn't really believe that was going to be going to be the case, but it is in my opinion, already the case. I use lightning regularly for real payments. Um, uh, not just, not just with bit refill, but with, with other things too. Um, but it's, it's actually genuinely useful to me in a way that, Bitcoin payments were useful to me like in 2014, 2015, 16. Um, I mean, okay, today, apparently, there's like no demand for Bitcoin block space. So you could just fire off your payments in Bitcoin anyway. But I still would, I still use Lightning when I can because it's faster, right? And it's more private. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's, that's what I mean about the 10x. It's even if you, you know, the, the base design is, is a work of genius. But it's also true that because it uses a game theoretic assumption, um, that that in itself just makes it a bit more clunky. And some people will say, oh, that's okay. L2 will fix that. And maybe, I don't know. L2 is another another discussion. I certainly understand why the developers are very excited about L2, which, by the way, is a terrible name, but we'll forget that. Um, so, so, yeah, what was I saying? So, so Lightning is, is really what excites me because, you know, there's a lot of activity there in, 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 a, in a kind of way that I saw, like, the very early days, my first you know, in quotes, arrived in Bitcoin, late 2012, early 2013. There's all this craziness going on, all this weird nonsense, you know, but it was exciting because people were trying things out. And I really feel like that with Lightning today. Yeah. Is there anything outside of Bitcoin, you know, like mm. the Bitcoin sphere that actually interests you? Probably NFTs, you know. I, <laughs> 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 I mean, NFTs is just kind of funny. I mean, uh, uh, there's not much to say about that. I mean, go, go ahead, you know, have fun. Again, have fun. You know, it's the same kind of thing. That's why so many people are attracted to like Ethereum type of stuff because because they just want to play around with fun, interesting things. And I, I think you at least you've got that somewhat enlightening. We we can accept the fact that Bitcoin is always going to be somewhat like it's not so much that it's dull and boring, it's more just that it's dangerous, really. And I've always tried to warn people off from just like using raw Bitcoin in a raw way. I mean, the the base layer, like people, if you ever print out a private key, then you're in a lot of trouble. Okay. So I'm not saying you're gonna lose your money, but you're probably gonna lose your money <laughs> if you start printing out private keys. Don't print out private keys. And I, you know, the, the, we have a private key f- like facility in, in Join Market because as far as I'm concerned, jo- concerned, Join Market users can take care of themselves. But that's dangerous. Then 
just sending a transaction is dangerous. It just always has been, and it and it and it and it always will be. But we we should accept that, right? I mean, if you if you make a wire transfer of a hundred thousand dollars, there's some serious consequences if you get that wrong, right? So it, it's like that kind of thing. It's a very heavy, serious form of money in my book. And yeah, you can you can buy a coffee with it for five dollars, but it's not designed for that, right? Um, so lightning's for like playing around and having fun. And that's what I was trying to get at. And, um, of course it's not just having fun. People are doing business with it, but, but it's that lower level, like, like at the, you can't put a figure on it, but let's say a thousand dollars and below for $500 and below. I don't know what, but certainly going all the way down to pennies, it works. Yeah. Um, are you asking me, Jerry, if there are other things that excite me apart from lightning? Is that, is that what you were saying? I was trying to. And yeah, not, yeah. not, not NFTs. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the thing is, my, I divide my time. Honestly, I spend an awful lot of time testing and coding on Join Market because there's a ton of work to do, and there's only a few of us doing it. It's, it's very hard work. But uh, um, apart from like things outside in my life that are nothing to do with Bitcoin, then the other thing that interests me has always been, like I said before, the cryptography. Like I've spent a lot of time studying uh elliptic curve cryptography and and some of the other constructions that you can make um and i'm always interested when people come up with int with like really novel new ways of like playing around with bitcoin scripts and using cryptography like uh, a good example is ruben somson's um succinct atomic swap that was a very interesting construct i haven't looked at it for about a year or, or more but it was there's there's all ideas like that or using like um Using like adapter signatures is another thing that's always fascinated me. Uh, and I've, I've been involved with stuff. The other thing I have done, although it's not so much recently, is I've tried to produce like um, reading materials and, and sort of almost teaching materials or guides on the more difficult cryptographic constructs like bulletproofs, confidential transactions, things using zero knowledge proofs. So, I mean, the, the only the, the, that's for me the real motivation for studying something like elliptic curve cryptography, which allows you to, to it allows you to see how some of these zero knowledge proof constructions work, and they that to my mind they're some of the most revolutionary and um, important developments in technology since you know since public key cryptography was invented in in the late seventies. Let's let's say. Uh, zero knowledge proofs. At some point, you you get you, you're able to sort of encapsulate any kind of computation under very crudely. You could say under encryption. It's not really encryption, but you know you can make it so that people can't see what's being computed, but can only see the output and still and still trust it. And 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 I'm I'm kind of counteracting what I said earlier, right? Because what I said earlier was, oh, Bitcoin needs to be really simple and everything, yeah. But I'm talking, that's the base layer, right? The, what we're talking about here, like we talk about lightning, we talk about zero knowledge proofs, all kinds of weird stuff, adapter signatures. That's stuff like at a layer above. And that's where we can get really creative, I think, at those higher layers. I mean, this is something that lightning and like uh, layers and I guess side chains can like mm. bring is like the uh, excitement or the space to imagine, I guess, and mess about that altcoins have. It's yeah, like, I guess one of their benefits, right, is that you know, definitely, there's, yeah, there's a lot of like room to, to mess about basically that you can't really yeah. do on the Bitcoin like, main uh yeah. chain. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's something that Lightning does bring. I guess something that, um, and this is something that I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, well, uh, making up to a degree here, but obviously, uh, there was that news, this rumor that Amazon is apparently going to be accepting Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and i can sort of smell amazon coin or something <laughs> coming at some point uh which is gonna i'm guessing like a binance chain rip off or something but um mm. i i i think uh something with, the, with lightning as well which again this is me totally assuming something but when when they say they're accepting bitcoin i can't for really imagine amazon accepting on-chain bitcoin all that frequently i i, I would imagine that it would be lightning that they would end up accepting i'm just again assuming here um but obviously if that were to happen uh, mm. obviously that will be uh, quite a big i guess test of of how much it can hold up to potentially a ton of people now suddenly making quite a lot of payments because a lot of people use amazon a lot of the time mm. um so i guess like that, that for me that's what I, I i've kind of been focusing on the last few days is thinking well how would that work and how would that hold up and how would amazon try and implement it and you know i just i think that's quite an interesting it is yeah. thing if, if they go down that road and obviously again i'm making assumptions based upon articles that have here you know sort of someone says but i i think it could be really interesting to see how it holds up i guess and how how it changes as well potentially if, if amazon brings loads of focus to lightning suddenly potentially you might have more people working on it and more interested in it and 
you know, yeah, I guess that's just something I've been thinking about. And so I can understand when you say mm. mining is exciting. For me, that's another reason why it's exciting. Yeah, the first thing that crops it comes to mind, isn't it? Which I think is what you're saying is, well, even if they were prepared to deal with like delays, there'd just, there'd just be way too much potential volume for that to, to hit the main chain. So they must be thinking of off-chain solutions. And the next thing you think is, well, there's also uh you know more custodial model like it's a bit like with the uh, with bit refill right you can you can directly pay for something with with lightning but you can also just like charge your your balance up either with main chain or with uh, lightning and then you can use that money to to buy things later uh so they might they might be thinking more like that or they who knows what they're thinking um i mean maybe we should really be talking about the yeah i guess that case is almost more interesting than el salvador isn't it because the numbers you could get via Amazon are, are so large, at least in theory, it could. But with El Salvador, I guess it's a bit smaller. But I don't know, maybe not, because that's the whole country. I, I don't really know. No, I, I, yeah, I get you, but I think you say it's, El Salvador is um, a lot more factual based. Um, mm. But then obviously there you've got the situation where a lot of people maybe don't have maybe don't have access to, you know, be able to use Bitcoin. And, and, and a big amount of the population don't understand it yet and probably won't for a little mm. while yet. And the mm. education is needed. It's an awesome opportunity. Um, but also, I guess it's been talked about a lot. And I suppose, yeah, that was just the first thing that came to mind when I heard about um, this potential Amazon rumor. It was like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, I, I can't imagine they're going to be accepting on chain unless, as you say, potentially a kind of account top up situation, maybe. Um, but yeah, I just, I just figured it was interesting to... It's, it's, I guess it's interesting, and that, that kind of uh, I'm already sort of somewhat very interested in Lightning, even though I don't still don't you know have a, a hundred percent uh, understanding of how it works. Mm. Um, but I guess that comes in even more so is like well the theoretical situation where it's like well hold up if Amazon with their millions around the whole globe suddenly decides to accept them, it's like well this could be a real big thing for Lightning and Bitcoin in, in the process, and 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 further layers and. And, and all sorts uh, suddenly being developed because obviously the internet wouldn't become what it has, is now if everyone didn't have interest in using it. I can imagine. And it, yeah. If everyone had just said, "Nah, we don't need to transfer information," and everyone just agreed, "We don't need to transfer information on a big web," then this wouldn't be <laughs> happening right now, would it? I guess. So um, yeah, I don't. Know. I, just, I, I thought it was a bit of sort of. A, I guess I've gone on a tangent. I've not really asked you a question, but I suppose it just explains what I was saying. No, I don't. I just. I do think though well, we, we should just just ignore it until something concrete happens because this story just keeps coming back. You know, PayPal's accepting, Amazon's accepting, and then at some point they do something and it ends up being so weak source usually that <laughs> it doesn't really matter. And I mean, you just don't. I just wait and see what they say. I mean, I guess yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, mm. speaking about Lightning Network, mm. I've heard conflicting things about how private it actually mm. is. Like some mm. people say it's super private and other people say it's not. Um, do you have any opinions on privacy in the Lightning Network? Yeah, I, 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 I must admit, I haven't like done my due, due diligence properly yet. I've seen a couple of talks and I've read a couple of things here and there about you know different ways in which uh, it can be it's the kind of network that can just inevitably be attacked in some sense by people probing. It's just the nature of the thing. Um, there will always be ways that people can kind of probe to find out where they, to try and find out where things start and finish, um, to try and find out, you know, the origin of a particular payment and so on. And, you know, there is, a, there is this kind of linking point of the, of the funding transaction, which um, you know in inevitably is on the blockchain, right? And so there is there is a sort of wa watermark there saying, well, this channel was created this time. But you know, it's a tough call. I think I, I can only go by intuition, really. My intuition is that whilst it's true that a network like this would not would not represent a decent level of defense against state level attack attackers you know somebody really well resourced and really determined to identify your payments i don't think it's good enough for that certainly not today and it, of course well that sort of feeds into my next point which is i think that it, it, it is going to improve with scale um there are other little improvements here and there the taproot soft walk will once it's implemented will significantly improve lightning privacy in at least two ways one way is that the what's called a point time lock contract, which is a very closely aligned concept to what I was describing earlier in the context of swaps. I was saying the use of adapter signatures enables you to sort of hide secrets in 
in signatures. There'll be a similar trick here where you're able to kind of share a secret along a path, along a, a route in the Lightning Network, but each individual hop in the route won't be using the same secret value. So it won't be possible for people to try and correlate a route using a single fixed secret or hash, specifically a hash value, as it is today. That's one of the ways Lightning uh, privacy can be attacked today. Although it's not necessarily easy, but you can do it. Um, what was I saying? Um, the other way that the Taproot softwalk, at least these are the two that spring immediately to my mind, the Taproot softwalk will, will, will help Lightning privacy is that a Lightning channel open and closed today are a very obvious thing. And why are they very obvious? Because they use a multi-sig contract in which it's a two of two multi-sig. And so when that thing gets spent, see the thing is when you create a multi-sig uh, output, you're sending to an address, which is just a, it was called a script hash address. So it's just it's still just the hash. So nobody really knows what the script was that created that hash. But when you then spend out of that of that UTXO, you have to reveal the entirety of the script that created the hash. And that, in the case of Lightning, that is a two of two multisig. And so even when um, even when the channel is open and closed normally, and there's no shenanigans, nobody drops out, nobody tries to cheat. Nevertheless, the script is revealed, and the script is a specific kind of 2 or 2 multi-sig. So it's pretty obvious, if not 100% obvious, uh, which UTXOs on the blockchain today are ingoing and outcoming from Lightning. And with Taproot, that won't be the case, and at least depending on people implement this, specifically because people can create... Um, uh, kind of uh, squished down um, multi-sigs into a single signature, which means that it will just like an or it look like an ordinary spend of a signal sig single signature output instead of a multi-sig. So the the grand goal of 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 Taproot Plus Nor is that wherever possible, every kind of script, whether it be um, uh, whether it be a complex script or 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 whatever will have this property where as long as everyone agrees, then we all pay out to one single SIG pub key. Or even though behind the scenes, it's actually like a 10 of 10 or something, you know. Um, sorry, I'm going on about Taproot. So you get the idea. I'm trying to give you a couple of examples where Taproot will help with Lightning Privacy. I don't think Lightning Privacy is at all perfect. It is the kind of network that is subject to attacks just because people can like go and talk to it it's it's an open network it's not like you can't compare it with like the swift network because that's all like encrypted wires that nobody can tap into <laughs> but we can all talk to the lightning network and so you can attack it but it will also get better with scale is like the third point i'd make i'm pretty sure that's true so um this is more like i'm um, tapping into your um into your nostradamus um for lack of better words <laughs> your predictions so um during um, the last bull run where we saw the micro sellers, you know, buying up Bitcoin and the whole, you know, Wall Street, you know, um, invasion of Bitcoin. Mm. So mm. Um, after that, I predicted that, you know, the next adoption wave of Bitcoin would be because we ha we've had retail mm. and we've had corporate. Now we'll be my, my next prediction will be that we'll be having nation states and um, mm. national treasuries actually, you know, buying up Bitcoin. And I think when I saw the news of El Salvador, you know, invest, um, making mm. Bitcoin legal tender, it kind of validated my prediction. Yeah. So then we, we, we also had the other extreme at the other end where we saw China, China basically kicking out Bitcoin from the state. And, and it basically we have two possibilities. Do you see, what do you, what do you think will be the future of Bitcoin for the next you know, two decades? We have, you know... Uh, <laughs> Easy questions, huh? <laughs> companies, uh, we see more yeah. of our country you know, buying up, you know, making Bitcoin, you know, in, in, mm. incorporating Bitcoin, integrating Bitcoin into their national framework or, you know, financial, financial you know, policies. Or would we see more of the China, you know, Chinese stance and, you know, more countries, you know, taking a stand against and banning Bitcoin, basically. I mean, I have no idea, but I think I think um, I've always felt like the best predictor of the future is the past. Uh, it's still a lousy predictor, but it's the best one, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you can come up with some theory completely, you know, ex nihilo, just make up your own theory about how the future will evolve. But I don't, I don't know, and I think looking at the way governments have reacted to Bitcoin over the last 
10 years, what's been the themes? I think the main theme has been ignorance. Um, there's a lot of, not just ignorance, but especially from like the, the sort of pundit class of e economists, it's, it's been like a very like outward sneering and laughing at Bitcoin as a concept from the early days. Um, that's slowly shifted, of course, but the only, the, the only thing they're really reacting to is the price signal. It's like they, you very clearly see how the, the, the sort of um, the, quali the quality, the kind of uh, the quality of their, 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 their discourse around Bitcoin is, is strongly affected by the price, but it, it's, they don't actually, it doesn't actually convince them to ever really study it. It's like to the minds of the, the political and economic class, Bitcoin is just an error. It's an error of the ordinary person or of the technical person or of any person who thinks it has value. It's just, they, 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 I don't see them changing their mind about that. And of course you could say, oh, the El Salvador case illustrates the opposite. But I suppose the El Salvador case illustrates the other kind of historical feature you'll see, not so much with governments, but with, with other things, which is it tends to be the smaller, the less powerful, the more out on the edge element of a particular group that, that gets interested in or takes takes interest in Bitcoin earliest, right? Um, and so El Salvador, you have a, a very small country, you know, very a relatively poor, I don't know exactly how poor, but it's relatively poor at least, um, you know, which has its own problems. I think I've heard it has problems with violence, and maybe maybe drugs. I can, I can imagine there's all kinds of drug war elements to it. But anyway, my point is it's just like it's a fairly minor thing. So if we think about the future, if you think about going out decades, it's really hard, but going into the future, I don't see any realistic prospect that the, the big power centers, you know, the Beijings, the, 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 the Washingtons, and, 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 and the European power centers are going to start to look at Bitcoin more favorably over the next several years. I would strongly suspect it will get more and more negative. Um, but it will also be slow. The reaction is always slow, you know. So how does this come to a head? I mean, we can hope that it comes to a, it, it, it doesn't come to a head, that it becomes a case of, well, so, you know, so much of your population has become connected with Bitcoin and Many of the politicians themselves don't forget they often secretly are buying Bitcoin in the background. This is an important point, right? Uh, it's an important dynamic because without that dynamic, we would just be in a direct out and out war. And I think we can hope that it continues to, the, the, the changes in policy, you know, continue to be slow as they have been. And eventually it reaches a point where it's, there's not really very much they can do. Because I think if that's not true, then it, regardless of, you know, some small states here and there decide to buy up some Bitcoin or to be positive towards it or use Bitcoin, the, the big states are going to be so massively against it because it's such a threat to their to their fundamental power. Um, I don't know. That's that's what I think. I really don't, don't know for sure. Mm. One thing we do know for sure is it's uh, a fair bit cheaper for them to store Bitcoin than it is to store gold. <laughs> that's for certain. Yeah. <laughs> the, amount, the amount of uh, security you have to... To have to have to store yeah. your gold as a, as a nation state. Yeah, I think now is probably a good time. I mean, we've run for about an hour, so it's probably a good time mm -hmm. to uh, to close up the uh, the conversation. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate the the time you've taken to to come and sit down with us three and uh, discuss uh, many different uh, Bitcoin goings ons we've uh, we've brought up. It's been uh, it's been much appreciated. Uh, really, and I've I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you as well and kind of getting your perspective. Uh, yeah, likewise, and, likewise, it was fun. Been much appreciated and uh but yeah also thank you to uh to everyone out there listening um for, for actually listening in uh, and if they want to uh i think you're on mastodon right rather than yeah yeah i have a i do i do micro blog on on mastodon yeah gotcha. i can so, give i can give you that link if you don't have it yeah yeah so i'll say there'll be a link wherever we've posted this that you're listening in or watching or whatever um so you can go and follow him on uh, mastodon um but yeah i say it's been been awesome to chat to you um everyone out there listening have an amazing day week year whatever um stay happy and uh, keep buying some bitcoin <laughs>